All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone uh, to uh, um, the presentation of the International Standards and Guidelines for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. Um, I am Dr. Deborah Adair, INQUITI's eighth president. I am so pleased to be able to share this information with you today. Um, and uh, um, I see people still joining. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. This presentation is titled as a talk with the developers, and that is what it is. But I must say that the INQUAHI ISGs actually represent the contributions of a great many people in our community. And as you will see in the presentation, including the INQUAHI board members and other individual experts in the field, our regional network partners and the INQUAHI membership of quality assurance practitioners and experts from agencies and institutions. Um, so we will go ahead and uh, start the presentation now. So it is my great pleasure to present the panel for the talk today. Dr. S uh, Susanna Karakayan, uh, Inquiki's immediate past president, <clears throat> excuse me, and the principal driver who envisioned and led the project. Uh, we also have Dr. Anna Pradas, Inquahi's treasurer, and Dr. Simona Laka, who both contributed greatly every step of the way to the development of the standards as well as the methodology that supports it. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we'll be presenting to you the evolution of the ISGs and why they are needed the methodology used in their development and the tr transition from the GGPs to the ISGs, the structure and the modules of the new ISGs, and the quality enhancement continu <coughs> excuse me, continuum enabled by the ISGs. So uh, we will get right into the presentation. I will turn this over to Dr. Susanna, who will begin talking about the evolution benefits and current landscape. Thanks, Deb, and thanks everybody for joining. As Deb mentioned, we are extremely excited to be here um, with all of you today and sharing back with you what we have jointly developed. We know that majority of you have been part of this development one way or the other, and it's an absolute pleasure to start the, the overall, uh, the official uh, you know, presentation with you. So um, when we were trying to put this talk together, uh, we decided, okay, what is the best way forward? And then um, based on the um, feedback that we have received is that let's delve deeper into the history and see how this all evolved and how this all became so important that Inguahi is now currently dealing and all other uh, uh, you know, uh, providers regionally also are dealing with the new standards and guidelines to, to, to support the relevance and equity and inclusion in higher education. So if we go to the next um, slide, like, if we briefly go into the history of um, evaluation of evaluators, uh, like um, evaluation of higher education providers, this originated in the USA. Um, the accreditation itself, uh, historically, it um, evolved in the um, end of 19th century, but um, in uh, mid 20th century, we already saw evaluate the need to evaluate the evaluators. Since the evaluators, the quality assurance providers started to emerge and expand and the, the market started to receive so many uh, providers, uh, quality assurance providers there that it was really absolutely necessary to understand who could be trusted and who could be not. So hence evaluation of evaluators. And it's all started from the US Department of State in 1965 that came first with the recognition of accreditors and that was done at the national level followed by CHIA, um, Council of Higher Education Accreditation in the US, uh, which is a, um, a network of uh, accreditor, uh, it's a, a organized evaluator of evaluators in the US, and it's again was at the national level. But the first international ones started from Inquahi, and the talks already started to emerge in 1998 and 1999, when um, there was a need to come up with um, international quality hallmarks. They first were called international quality hallmarks because it was necessary to, to set up the, uh, the standards and the approaches. There was a huge debate in the beginning whether we should at all use the word standard, 
because um, uh, it was all premature and the systems were not ready for it. That is why the decision was, okay, we're still uh, collecting the good practices and we will be working forward towards that. And uh, we will see in the next slide how it evolved into the standards. But um, again, uh, from the international perspective, Inguahi started the first steps uh, through developing um, international quality hallmarks. And then Enqua, and the European network came with the, in 2005, with European standards and guidelines. APQN came with the Chiba principles. Based on the Chiba principles, they developed their, um, sorry, there is some misprint over there, uh, Asia Pacific, and then RIASIS in Latin America, uh, they came up with the um, Latin American um, context. So um, for the Latin America. And next slide, please, Bia. Um, well, we also discussed a lot, what is the difference between the international standards and guidelines and the regional standards? Uh, is there an overlap? Is there a duplication? And then um, we, we, uh, we all delve deeper to understand that there is none. And there is no duplication because predominantly when we look at the regional standards like um, uh, that cover European, um, uh, Asia Pacific, and then um, uh, Latin American, Caribbean, then we have national standards for the US, then um, it's clear that they are serving their uh, regional um, and national uh, purposes, promoting their national and regional agendas. Uh, the capacity building again evolves around, around the contextual specifics of each of the region. But when we talk about the international standards and guidelines, we talk more about uh, mobility, about the, the, the um, mobility um, cross-border provisions, um, recognizing it regionally and globally and trying to take it the systems to the place where the mutual recognition could happen at the international level. Um, and most importantly, this, um, these standards also play a role of safeguarding the quality assurance internationally and recognition of quality issues providers to conduct reviews locally and globally, enabling transferability of results across the regions. So it's more of an umbrella uh, framework to enable the regions to talk to each other and set up a common language of understanding between the regions when we talk about the quality assurance practices. This is why uh, the international standards and guidelines were really um, necessary to come into play um, to uh, add up, to complement and supplement what is there at the regional re level rather than to duplicate or overlap. So if we go further, um, then um, international quality hallmarks, they have lots of benefits. The benefits are both internal to the external quality insurance bodies, and, um, and internal um, and external to the, to those um, uh, providers, accreditors. Um, in the first place, um, internal benefits for the organization is that it provides a firm platform for quality insurance bodies in their daily operations and enhancement. You get a clear picture of where you stand, how you should be operating, and um, what what are the gaps and uh, opportunities there for you. Um, it's a self reflection tool to improve and enhance. Uh, it helps professionalization of the staff, of the experts, of the procedures and overall capacity building. It helps to maintain relevance of the quality assurance provisions and um, encourages supporting good practices that expanding potentials for collaboration. And also this is a key tool for tr promoting transparency on what is going on in the system and how to make it um, more beneficial for the uh, stakeholders. It's one of the uh, accountability uh, tools also for the organization. Well, when we look at the benefits that are for the exter um, external benefits um, to, the, uh, to the quality assurance bodies is uh, they, they feel secure because this helps to safeguard systems from bogus providers. Uh, it's public assurance of the quality of higher education provisions. There is opportunities for mutual recognition um, for, of uh, accreditation procedures and the decisions taken. Uh, there is a promoted trust in our operations and therefore more opportunities for meaningful and productive cooperation. Promotion of, um, it, it also would help to promote uh, UN regional and global conventions. These revised uh, international standards and guidelines embed in themselves the, the key elements that are highlighted in the UN regional and global conventions which relates to the relevance, quality, equity, and inclusion in higher education. 
And also, again, this is the establishing a common language communicating between the diverse systems. As we know, standards, um, so well, we all say that standards are, um, you know, imposing things, but it, it depends on how you set the standards. And uh, the key benefits um, for this of the standards is trying to create um, a framework within which everybody will would understand each other and speak the same language, hence promote the recognition. Otherwise, if we all keep to all um, separate standards which are distinct to each other, then the recognition would be become uh, nearly not possible. So there are so many benefits coming from this, and um, we are we are more than sure that um, the uh, this uh, state with this statement because the organizations that have gone through the wise former reviews um, against the guidelines of good practice they have um, affirmed their um, uh, belief in this and um, trust in this. Next slide, please. Um, well, again, a brief history of the Inquahi standards. And as, as I have said, it all evolved from the um, idea of having the international quality hallmarks. Um, they were very cautious to start with the terminology of, of standards and the quality hallmark, hallmarks were also well used with caution. But that was the um, first edition, and when it came into being, these were called a quality hallmarks. The second edition, um, again, uh, after the broad consultation with the stakeholders, um, it was it became clear that well, we're not yet ready to set the the um, standards globally or, or quality hallmarks because the systems are so diverse that we still need to have them approved and assured, I mean, that they are actually serving the need. Um, so they moved into the principles. So these were, the second edition was called principles of good practice. Um, so that uh, the quality insurance providers globally could drawing on those principles could uh, further develop their own um, uh, standards and guidelines to fit their needs. 2006 and 2016, we had two uh, editions and both of them already were uh, named guidelines of good practice. And so far, throughout all these years, um, these were uh, just in terms of principle guidelines and we see the evolution here. Um, after the um, global study done by Ingwahi, it became clear that um, the system is already ready. International system is already mature enough to, to, to welcome those standards and guidelines. And uh, hence, Inquahi established the team and uh, the huge methodology, which will be presented later on to start development of the fifth edition. We're happy to say that after two years of hard work, um, we published this, the global study in 2020. And after that, we embarked on the development of the international standards and guidelines. And we're happy to say that um, within the two years, we have, uh, through the robust methodology, we have been able to develop this and now we're um, presenting this for your use and for you to benefit from this. We also came up uh, with the um, a logo um, in this um, and uh, Bahrain for, and BQA uh, is to be credited for this uh, because they developed that for us. And um, you would see that um, the, stand, the logo itself also presents uh, the concept behind this is that it presents unity, holisticness of approaches to QA aimed at safeguarding and continuous enhancement of quality through international quality hallmarks. You will see that all those, each, each and every word in this definition is embedded in the standards and the guidelines. Uh, next, Bia. Um, basically, well, I made a reference to the global study and how did it all start? I mean, through the global study, we already identified that there is a huge diversification of tertiary education provisions. and. I, I, I am more than sure that for the last couple of years or five years, you have been hearing this a lot, starting all the, all the webinars, all the conferences, they all start with this major paradigm change that happened in higher education and how we as quality assurance are still keeping to the old standards. So it was time actually again to address this huge diversification. And diversification is not only in terms of the provisions, but the diversification of the needs coming from the learners, diversification of higher education um, um, provisions. Higher education is no longer limited to higher education institutions, it goes beyond. And then diversification of quality assurance providers themselves. 
As per our global study, we have found that there is a huge diversity of quality assurance providers. They could be there only for capacity building. They could be as well there for capacity building and external reviews. And they could be as well there for training provisions only. So there, there, there is a huge area, a, a huge um, scope of quality assurance providers as well. And there was an absolute need for us uh, for, to, to address those diverse providers there too. And also affirmation of quality globally. Um, we, we see that how um, uh, with the transformations, diversification and the major paradigm change, the government started already complaining and the system started um, complaining a lot about the relevance and the quality. They, this relevance and quality have become buzzwords everywhere. How to resolve this and how to ensure that the governments are um, satisfied with the provisions of the quality assurance providers, the entire education in general. And that is why it was absolutely timely for, um, for Inquiry to join efforts to actually start developing this. And we, again, um, happy to see that we had um, very good um, engagement from the global quality issues community when we were developing those standards. Um, next slide, please, Pia. Um, uh, we also, um, in terms of, with, along with the transformations, um, uh, diversification and the whole learning par paradigm change, we also had some soft regulations and soft guidance coming from UN. And we, we all talk about SDGs and uh, of course, all the SDGs are one way or the other, they all relate to, to education. But the key here is goal four, which is uh, specifically on education and promotes um, uh, equitable um, and quality um, access to a quality education. So um, these are uh, the SDGs are also supported by two um, uh, conventions coming from UNESCO. And this is the Global Convention for Recognition of Qualifications, which is the first time that um, these conventions started to embed in themselves the term quality assurance. You see the UN, UN regional conventions on the recognition, there are all in all five of them. And in the initial versions, which were developed in um, 1970s, they didn't have the term quality assurance in it, but there was already a concept of mutual recognition and uh, recognition of qualifications out there. And, uh, but the tools were not uh, specified. Now in these revised um, regional conventions, uh, the, the clear highlight is on the quality assurance as well. Since we have um, this guidance also adding up to the, um, uh, to the um, style study and findings we have had so far, um, about uh, inclusive and equitable education, taking to lifelong learning, relevance and quality, and all of this has the quality and quality assurance at the heart, taking to recognition of formal, non-formal and informal provisions. And this is the first attempt ever we have done globally to start also a quality assure the non-formal uh, provisions in terms of the short learning programs and micro-credentials. And you will hear more here. And, and those micro-credentials that we are uh, trying to get uh, to have recognized quality assurance and hence recognized they don't only come from higher education providers, but also from the industry providers and from beyond the higher education sector itself. So if we go further, um, uh, also an, one of the key elements that was embedded in the standards is the values. Values drive the system. This is what we believe in. This is what we abide by. And this is what we want to see happening because um, if, we don't set clear values, it's not clear what for we are actually trying to invest so much effort into developing, implementing, and um, conducting all these activities um, around the quality assurance. And those values are currently embedded in um, the standards are in Guahi values in terms of diversity, inclusiveness, independence, and academic freedom. As uh, you, you probably, most of you have read recently, but majority of the higher education values in terms of integrity, academic uh, freedom, independence, and those are loosely uh, reflected in the current standards that are in place. And we need to strengthen them more to empower the higher education when it's come, it comes to the um, promoting the values in higher education. And those values have been actually integrated into the standards that um, we're, we're happy to share with you. Next um, 
slide there. And uh, with this, um, yeah, we're happy to open up with the uh, questions later on. Just send your questions there. I will be trying to respond, but then back to you to take yeah. forward the methodology. Thank you, Susanna. And yes, please put your, uh, I'd like to invite you to put your questions in the Q&A so uh, we can better respond. It would be, I'm afraid they'll get lost if you put them in the chat, but if you put them in the Q&A, we're happy to answer those as we go forward. So um, uh, to begin talking about the development of the ISGs, um, we can start with the timeline. So next slide, thank you. Um, Uh, so essentially there were three periods of development work that uh, led up to the, the ISGs. The first was the preparatory work to develop the initial set of standards, uh, the lit review, the document analysis, with, uh, leading heavily on the Inquahi global study as Susanna had uh, pointed out earlier, focus groups, and then finally the draft of, this, of the, the initial draft of the standards. And actually, if any of you who are attending today um, participated in the initial focus, focus groups uh, or perhaps participated with the data collection piece that uh, came later, uh, it would be great to, to uh, know that you're here. And if you'd want to you know, put that in the chat so we know that uh, uh, you were one of the participants that contributed to this work, we'd be glad to see that. Um, so the, the next section um, after the 2020 to 2021 period, um, uh, we took a, a, over this two month period from February to March of 2022, we worked on refining and drafting with the support and the approval of the Inquiry Board of Directors, um, and along with a process of stakeholder consultations, uh, including a survey to collect data and specific feedback. So this, this February to March period was all about collecting um, collecting data and uh, helping to refine the draft of the uh, standards. And then from April to May 2022, uh, we worked on the finalization of the ISGs to accommodate the feedback uh, from the stakeholder consultations and the surveys and all of the all of the um, uh, different methods of consultation that we engaged in. Uh, and then the final approval by the Inquiry Board of Directors. And thank you, by the way, for uh, noting in the chat if, if you were participating in any of that. Um, and through all of this, the project was guided by the working group uh, and informed by externally invited experts who made significant contributions to the content of the ISGs. And here on this slide, we get a little closer look at the work to develop and validate the standards. Um, we had 97 participants in the focus groups that represented 24 countries and 17% of quality assurance bodies globally. Uh, and in the online survey, there were 108 respondents from 50 countries. So uh, there were many countries represented, many perspectives represented in the, uh, uh, the consultations that we did leading up to the ISGs. Next slide, please. All right, so this is the implementation timeline. You can see it starts in June 2022 through January 2023. Uh, and so we are, we are working right now on the implementation phase of the project. So for the second half of 2022, we've been refining for clarity and consistency and going through an editing process. And of course, today we're presenting the results of this multi-year effort. Starting in January, to the first half of 2023, we're officially launching the ISGs with introductory sessions and with trainings. Um, and then starting in July of 2023 and moving forward, the ISGs will be used in self-informal reviews for recognition. That is not to say that before July uh, that we can engage with uh, individual agencies who are, who are interested in moving forward, uh, but uh, we will, uh, in July is when we will be um, basically making the switch from the GGPs to the ISGs. Next slide. Okay, so um, the, uh, the, uh, the, since the ISGs built from Inquahi's experience with the GGPs, 
it's good to sort of mark the difference between those two sets. And Susanna went through this a little bit in her slides, uh, but the, the changes are really about, um, you know, the intended audience of the of the GGPs and that now this is the international, I mean, the intended audience of the ISGs, which is now open to all QA providers beyond the INQUIHI membership. Um, the intention, focus, structure, and application of the standards, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach, but rather a more customized approach to recognize the diversity in the field. Um, we have, uh, and, and part of that involves a modular approach that we'll be explaining a little bit later in this presentation. Um, we have an emphasis on measuring outcomes and the impact of the higher education system and a, and a way to do that that can accommodate the diversity of the both higher ed provision and then the quality assurance uh, agencies um, uh, mandates and work. Um, we have, uh, as Susanna was talking about our values, we have a new value driven evaluation focusing on uh, relevance, recognition, integrity of higher education uh, values. And, um, you know, we are looking to provide feedback and evaluation for EQ EQA providers um, using uh, a set of enhancement guidelines to be able to add value to the uh, EQ, EQA providers, regardless of sort of level of experience or maturation. All right, next slide. Okay, so now uh, I'm happy to, to pass this over to uh, uh, talk about the new ISG structure and, and modules to Anna, I mean, to Simona and then Anna. Thank you, Deb. So uh, when we are speaking about the structure of uh, the new GIS, uh, uh, there is in fact, um, or we have in mind uh, the, the main aim of uh, this um, approach. The ISGs uh, are designed with a modular, with a modular approach. Uh, and that is, uh, firstly, to enable appropriate recognition of diverse tertiary education and diverse and QA provisions uh, based on the specific profiles and taking into consideration also the enhancement continuum of the external quality assurance providers. That's why uh, if we see the, the structure of the guidelines for good practice, and we then uh, look at the international standards and guidelines, we see there are now uh, actually four modules. We are speaking about uh, the first module, which is mandatory. And uh, it's uh, in fact a, a basic baseline standards um, required uh, for uh, all quality assurance providers. And uh, after that, uh, there are different modules that uh, address different categories. For instance, module two, cross-border, is uh, dedicated with its uh, subsequence. Uh, it's the first um, cross-border uh, quality assurance, which applies to external quality assurance providers that conduct external reviews across country borders and jurisdictions, and quality assurance of cross-border education, which applies to um, external quality assurance providers that conduct quality assurance of cross-border education. Then for the ones interested in um, uh, short learning programs, uh, there are uh, there is the module, module three, dedicated to short learning programs, and then module four, dedicated to online or blended education. The app is the next one. So uh, we have, um, as uh, mentioned before, uh, the baseline uh, standard, uh, which are mandatory. And um, in fact, uh, we speak about uh, three sections um, in the content of the international standards and guidelines. You will find the first section, uh, 
which um, speaks uh, about um, the baseline. And then um, the second one, which tells us each module uh, related to the, um, uh, the, provide, the um, quality assurance providers are able to select the modules that um, um, fits um, their needs. Uh, then uh, the third section um, is um, presenting the guiding principles to promote continuous enhancement and impact of uh, external quality assurance providers um, in terms of the so-called uh, maturity levels. We will speak about them later. Just a few words uh, about uh, the, the each uh, module. So um, first one is uh, the first, not the first, but uh, uh, the one uh, related to cross-border quality assurance uh, is, um, as mentioned before, um, uh, dedicated to the providers that conduct external reviews across country borders. And um, we have um, uh, four sections related to mandate, policies and procedures, relevance of standards and recognition. And you will find standards uh, or criteria uh, developed uh, for each of these um, uh, four sections. Uh, we speak about uh, mandate, mission and strategy and ask the, the providers uh, to have uh, stated in their mission uh, the kind of uh, that uh, they uh, perform external quality assurance activities they uh, perform. Then uh, there is uh, the requirement about the assignment with the international directives. And here um, uh, we ask the um, um, quality assurance providers to take into consideration relevant international reference points. Uh, when we speak about policies and procedures, uh, we look uh, primarily at relevance, uh, to have uh, cl clear uh, policies and procedures related to a certain type of uh, uh, QA activity. Uh, in, this, um, in this case, the um, cross-border quality assurance. And then to have uh, um, the expertise to, to implement that, to conduct this kind of uh, uh, evaluations. Um, and uh, this um, implies um, to have uh, qualified um, external reviewers, but also high qualified staff, internal staff of the agencies. Then uh, relevance of standards uh, in terms of equivalent uh, provisions and then uh, context and culture. Uh, under each of these two uh, sections that are developed uh, diverse uh, criteria. Um, for instance, uh, uh, we have to be very clear about uh, taking into account uh, the local context and the culture and um, different types of um, providers that can um, uh, act in a certain region. And finally, recognition of outcomes. Um, the um, quality assurance provider needs to ensure the outcomes uh, of its reviews uh, are recognized in the context they operate in in international environment. The same for uh, the cross border education. <clears throat> the same uh, for um, sections, uh, which uh, are um, are described here. Um, more or less in terms of uh, major standards, uh, you can find the same uh, ideas, but of course uh, uh, the, the criteria developed under each standard um, are in, um, in or take into account the specificity of this uh, QA activity. Um, for instance, uh, in the relevance of standards, uh, we uh, are very careful with uh, the learning experience of uh, the learners. 
uh, that um, have to uh, be uh, taken into consideration by the um, external quality assurance provider standards. When it comes to uh, module three, the quality assurance of short learning programs, here again, we are looking to the um, uh, main sections, mandate policies and procedures, relevance of standards and resources, and uh, uh, have uh, an, or try to make sure that uh, the, um, the QA providers under review uh, have the mandate, mission, and strategies um, in this respect, um, ensure clarity and relevance of the policies and procedures. The relevance uh, is mainly related to the um, uh, links with the labor market, uh, partnerships, industry, and um, very important, the assessment of uh, student achievement uh, including ensuring of the academic integrity here, um, the recognition of outcomes, methodology and modality of delivering uh, these programs, uh, and of course, resources to delivering them. Uh, another important uh, thing here is related to the resources. And um, here we speak about the, the human resources um, uh, mandatory to conduct uh, QA activities uh, in this um, uh, short learning uh, programs. Yeah. Here uh, uh, the, is the fourth uh, module and I would uh, like to invite Anna to continue with it. Thank you. Thanks, Simona. So during the focus groups, we could see concern about what we have just presented, the cross-border cross provision of quality assurance, the cross-border um, education, and also about the short learning programs or micro-credentials. But also a third challenge appeared very clearly, the expansion of online and, ble um, online and blended learning programs in traditional face-to-face -face tertiary education providers. This model applies to quality assurance of distance education that is online or blended. Other forms of distance education are addressed within the baseline standards. It's a structure in these three sequential stages, mandate, policies and procedures, and relevance of the standards. Uh, beginning with the mandate, there must be a clear mandate. External quality assurance providers mandate must include distance education in the scope of its external um, reviews. And they also must ensure appropriate expertise. So both staff and external evaluators are able to determine the achievement of intended learning outcomes, regardless of the technological approach. Policies and procedures. Uh, external quality assurance bodies must provide clear definitions for distance education and how tertiary education providers may apply for approval. They also must have transparent policies about what is required for initial modification or authorization. And finally, regarding relevance of standards, external quality assurance providers must have standards to ensure two things, equivalency and quality. Equivalency is a key element of this quality assurance of online and blended education, and there is extensive guidance about how we can ensure equivalent learning experiences for online and blended uh, students. And regarding quality, there must be standards to ensure that tertiary education providers are evaluating and reporting on their distance education courses and programs. Okay, so shall we go to the procedures of the international standards and guidelines? At the moment, we offer we will offer the same three pathways that we have for the GGP review. Um, regarding the first pathway, is through an evaluation carried out by INQUAHI, which involves a self uh, self evaluation, an external review, a decision on the alignment, and an award of the label. Uh, the second pathway is the joint review. This goes through an evaluation carried out jointly by INQUAHI and another reputable external evaluator. And it involves, it will begin with the synthesis of the criteria of both external evaluators and will imply a single review procedure with two separate decisions and awards of recognition. And the third pathway is the recognition of the baseline model uh, through the provision of independent uh, evidence of the alignment by a credible, reputable external organization, um, the ICI 
uh, the external quality assurance uh, provider will have to present uh, the criteria and the procedures applied, as well as the external assessment report and the decision made. And INQAGE will rec recognize and award the INQAGE level. level. All three procedures end with the inclusion in the register of the external quality assurance providers aligned with the ISGs. Okay, so let's go to the third section of these international standards and guidelines. This is about the uh, quality enhancement continuum. Uh, this third section um, is jointly with the modular approach, the major innovation of this initiative. And this is why in this section we will find guidelines and not a standard, because it's an innovation. In, uh, as you know, in Inquaki we treasure diversity, and although we do have members with only two years of activity, we have we do have external quality assurance providers with a much, much longer experience. A considerable amount of us uh, have between 15 to 30 years of experience and have undergone more than one or two external quality assurance reviews already. The guiding principles aim to incentivize continuous and more superior performance and impact at system level with each cycle of external reviews, so that each and every external review adds value to the organization that is assessed, right? So the section begins with a definition of what is efficiency, relevance and transformation, and then proceeds with detail, detailed rubrics at functional, operational, financial and systemic level. Each level builds on and adds to the previous one. So relevance builds on efficiency, transformation on relevance, so they are not independent, right? And external, external quality assurance providers, the idea is that we must be efficient. We must achieve our goals while minimizing resources use watch usage, but we also must aim at relevance, ensuring that our activities are suitable to the priorities and policies of our stakeholders and have impact on the system and on the system enhancement. And the aspirational level is helping to transform tertiary education system, proactively engaging in activities that lead to the relevance of tertiary education provisions and enhance trust and accountability. This section also identifies observable evidences that will be on the basis of the evaluation. It is a summative evaluation that can be used both for self-evaluation and external review. And the output of this assessment, this is important, is not to going to be a level, but a set of relevant recommendations for continuous enhancement. And with this, I will end my part of the presentation. And we go back to the acknowledgement. Okay, thank you, Anna, and uh, um, it's my my pleasure and honor to to um, make a few acknowledgments about this um, about the ISGs and the, the work that that sits behind them. And why I do this, I just invite you again if you um, if, if questions have occurred to you as we've gone through this, please put them in the in the Q and A, and we will circle back to them at the end of the presentation. Be happy to to answer any of them. So, if they come to mind while we're while we're um, going through the acknowledgement, please put them in the Q and A. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, actually at the beginning. Um, the ISGs are the work of a great many people uh, and contributions really from the global tertiary education quality assurance community across all of the regions. So uh, you can see here on the left, we had some, um, we had invited a specific group of experts from the field to, um, to provide very focused uh, uh, feedback and advice on the particular modules in particular, the, the modular modules of the ISGs. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Deborah Everhart from uh, Credential Engine, uh, Dr. Esther Hidalgo from a uh, ACU Cat Catalonia, Dr. Leah Matthews from the DEAC, uh, uh, Ms. Concepcion, um, Russo from uh, again from AQ, uh, Dr. Yaping Gao from Quality Matters, and Dr. Sebastian Rodriguez uh, uh, from Spain. So this was the group that helped us um, um, pay particular attention uh, to the to the um, 
uh, relevance, relevance and content of the, the modules as we develop them. And on the right, you can see the INQUAHI working group members, which is uh, many of the INQUAHI board members are reported, are, are represented here, um, and, as well as their role at their own agencies. Um, and INQUAHI secretariat staff as well um, are on this list. This was really a joint effort uh, and many hands were required to make this move forward. Uh, we did have an editor and we have, we're very appreciative for the work of uh, uh, Dean Neubauer um, to do the work of the editing of the uh, ISG and the logo and branding. As Susanna had already uh, mentioned uh, that uh, the BQA uh, um, provided the the logo design for us um, and uh, Tariq Mohammed, who did his best to uh, convey uh, all of the conceptual drivers behind the logo. So I just want to say thank you very much to everyone who had a hand and thank you to those who are here and maybe not here, who participated in some way in the focus groups and the different consultations we've had because it, it takes this many voices and the kind of broad perspectives that we gathered to create something like the ISGs. So thank you very much and um, happy to have your questions. And uh, Susanna, since I, I will invite you to, to take this last one. I know you're typing, but maybe take this last question and just uh, um, take it orally so everyone can hear. Yeah, hi. There are a couple of questions here mm -hmm. and uh, to to cover them, um, uh, basically, what are the costs and the timeline involved in the different recognition pathways? Um, we would like to say that at this point, no procedural um, changes have been introduced. It's only the standards that have been changed and standards and guidelines that are changed. So the procedures are the same and the costs are the same as uh, they were before. Um, um, but we are envisioning changes in the procedure as well, as well as um, uh, and, and separate arrangements for the decision making. But this will come later on in the stage. Um, so uh, then it comes to the question of overloading agencies with several external reviews, um, maybe combining the reviews. And um, I, this is an anonymous attendee. And I can't uh, agree more with you that um, that is why Inquahi offers three different, different procedures there. Uh, there is a pathway as Anna introduced um, fully for uh, recognition of, of a standalone organization. Then there is a joint review if um, necessary um, to, to conduct it with another reputable uh, organization. And also, uh, Inguahe recognizes the, the prior made um, uh, decisions um, taken. For example, we have a number of cases coming from the European, but they, these cases predominantly come from uh, Europe uh, because um, it's only in Europe that uh, external review of quality assurance providers is a, an active uh, procedure and in North America, in part of North America, but uh, globally it's yet to be introduced. Um, 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 like it's introduced globally, they are also uh, practicing this, and some or the organizations have undergone a couple of reviews, but it's not um, uh, uh, the it doesn't bear the massive character that uh, Europe has. So we received uh, we receive also requests from um, uh, European quality assurance agencies, which they are recognized after we have synthesized the standards and have done the the mapping across uh, against the uh, our current GGPs. So um, there is a recognition procedure in place with us too. Okay, so Deb, maybe back to you to Sinais because this question is on online model, modules maybe. Um, Deb, you are muted. Oh, sorry. I was saying there are also some questions in the chat we can circle back to. Um, so the question here is the new, the new ISGs by modules includes the online module. It means the agency needs to have, uh, have it in the country. This is, the modules are optional. So if it's relevant for um, 
for you and your agency, if this is the, the work that you do, then then you would select that module to, to be reviewed against. And um, so it really is um, uh, up to the agency itself to determine if that's a relevant, uh, if, you're, if you're doing this work, then you would wanna choose that module. Yeah, indeed, uh, to add to what Deb said, or oh, the, the um, optional modules, they are there to cover the specific needs of organizations. For example, a quality assurance provider might have in the mandate only review um, um, per of the traditional uh, provisions like program and institution accreditation, but not so much um, the mandate to do the cross-border quality assurance or, or quality assurance of micro-credentials, for example. That might not be in the mandate of the organization. So. Um, we, for example, in our with the with current GGPs, uh, we have quality assurance providers turning to us, and one of the GGPs is on internationalization. And this standard we are skipping in many cases because it's not applicable to some organizations. They don't have it in their mandate. So that is uh, therefore there was a need to um, to make sure that through this optional selective modules we are making sure that we are covering this diversity while not restricting or not uh, putting straight, straight jacketing the organizations. It's just per profile, the revision per profile. So, um, and you would have seen that in all the modules um, and the key, uh, key section on the standards was on the relevance. What we noticed uh, throughout um, the global study and looking at diverse systems globally is that in majority of the cases, the same set of standards was applied in all types of provisions, which is no longer relevant. As um, Deb multiple times mentioned, one, stand, one size doesn't fit it all. And hence, this modular approach is there to support this diversity and to make sure that the standards you are using for specific modules are relevant for that particular review type. For example, if you are a cross-border quality, you are looking at a cross-border provision, you have to make sure that your standards are covering the specifics of cross-border provision, rather than you are using a generic standard which is applicable at your national level or in this country and imposing them on the cross-border providers. So in the, in the bottom line, it's all about promoting relevance, making sure that these standards, the, the standards we are all using are actually serving the needs of that particular provision. There is a question about the, um, e-car register in Europe be connected formally. Um, there is no talk about any formal connection yet. There has been no discussion, but definitely the organizations that are listed in e-car and have come to us, as we have uh, shared um, earlier, there has been a recognition procedure done by the Inquahi decision-making body. And then this uh, organization was without any, um, if there is a need to cover, uh, if there is a misalignment with our standards, we would request additional information about our standards and guidelines. But if everything else is covered, then the um, mutual recognition will happen. Um, well, yes, we will be offering trainings um, to, to quality insurance providers, to experts, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, you should expect uh, hearing more um, starting January. In January, we're having um, another panel and we will be inviting uh, global um, tertiary education experts uh, coming and talking about IHGs and they will be reflecting on IHGs from their own perspectives. These people have worked with uh, more than 100 governments and they will be talking about application of the IHGs in, the, in diverse contexts. Um, and uh, for, uh, following that, we are going to offer um, a series of trainings um, for the quality insurance providers, for the experts, uh, so that we could um, uh, seamlessly induce the standards into the operation. So um, anybody take the next question? I can take it, uh, the one from uh, Veronique. Uh, yes, Veronique, in fact, uh, it's, um, uh, the uh, the only stand stand or the baseline standard is the one that is um, mandatory. So uh, if uh, not none of uh, the modules uh, three two three and four are um, of interest uh, for an agency or quality assurance provider, uh, then uh, 
the first one can be taken. And uh, of course, uh, the recommendations and uh, the enhancement uh, section uh, will be addressed as well. Yeah. And there's a, I'll, I'll read a few questions that I found in the chat. And <clears throat> if any of you, any of the panelists want to take this. One was, um, can you please elaborate on the question of rubrics and, and what type of judgments are attached to the reviews of both QA agencies and AGI? Yeah, if I may. Uh, the question that the mention of rubrics was made uh, regarding the quality enhancement continuum. We have built a matrix with these three, um, three levels of enhancement from efficiency, relevance, transformation, and then at these functional operational levels and so on. Okay. So the rubrics is what you can see behind, you can see inside this matrix, this, this matrix. And uh, the idea, we are not going to review the ter uh, health education, um, tertiary education providers. We are going to, to review external quality assurance bodies. We don't use the, this is a, a thing that I learned in Inquaje, uh, the, 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 the expression of quality assurance agencies, it's, it's very, very well used, very well used, it's the, the, the use in Europe, but outside Europe, uh, there are other forms uh, of, of, uh, of, um, of citing or yeah or colleagues right so in in the US they are accreditors and they can fulfill several roles and so this is why we use the word external quality assurance providers but they are not tertiary education providers they are just uh, like quality assurance agencies in fact uh, so but they are not buffer man don't don't worry about that there is a glossary at the end of the international standards and guidelines that i recommend you because i think it's very useful for this kind of misunderstandings about uh, what each thing is, is applied to and uh, this is very useful for us so the rubrics are it's what in, it's inside this matrix and uh, yeah and and it's going to be recommendations once we have assessed the rubrics, okay? So there is not going to be a level. You are at efficient level, you are at the relevance level, you are at transformational level. That's what mm, we are not aiming at. We are aiming at pro triggering this continuous enhancement and the agencies. Yeah, if I could uh, add to this point, um, as uh, Anna rightly mentioned, this, uh, the need to come up with the um, guidelines for continu uh, continuous enhancement was uh, based on the findings from coming from all over the world. I mean, those organizations that have been there for um, uh, years and have undergone more than three to four cycles of reviews, they found that the reviews are becoming less relevant to their needs and um, they, they need something more for enhancement purposes. So the whole idea here is that these rubrics are there and the beauty of the rubrics is that it can be used, we said the rubrics there, that it can be used in both ways. It can be used for your, by yourself to analyze internally where you stand in terms of efficiency of your organization or uh, relevance and transformation. And by the way, you should note that these are not only the terms used. When we talk about efficiency is um, the capacity of the organization to efficiently function and also to influence um, on the efficiency of the system. So it's end result coming is what is the outcome? What is the impact on the system in terms of efficiency, in terms of the relevance, whether the, the organization is able to drive relevant education um, and whether the organization is able to drive the transformations in the students, transformations in learning. It's not only transformation of the organization, quality insurance provider itself. So the beauty of the rubrics there is that it will enable you to do the self-evaluation yourself so that you see where you stand and it will help the external quality assurance panel members um, when they do the review uh, of your organization, it will help them to, to see where you are and what are the recommendations for enhancement to enable the efficiency, to enable um, relevance, and to enable the systemic transformation. Um, again, these are not uh, applied per standard. It's the, the, the generic, um, these uh, rubrics are used to come up with the summative uh, evaluation on what on the type of organization you are on the the, the level of um, uh, on the on the level of you know um, uh, enhancement you are in and what is there to be enhanced further um, and it's uh, and we hope that it is a useful tool for you. 
Okay, uh, and there's another question in the, the chat. It's a two part question in addition to congratulations on the to the team. Uh, the questions are how do we reach out to the broader students globally to identify the ISG compliance? And then did ISG take into account global rankings as they impact students? Well, we are not, um, well, we have to acknowledge that there is a diversity of tools to evaluate performance of institutions. There are rankings, diverse types of rankings, and there is a quality assurance. And there are all other diverse systems out there, and each of them plays its own role. Quality assurance is not there to substitute or to, you know, um, uh, overlap with the ranking. It's not, this, they all serve different purposes. And that is why each of the tools serves its own mission. Quality assurance has um, a broader target on having impact on the system, society at large, inclusiveness, and assuring equitable education. But when you look at the ranking, I don't think that equitable is one of the terms that ranking could be using. For example, this is the, what we are going through. Well, the driving principles for quality assurance totally are different from the driving principles of ranking. And that is why I would look at both of those instruments separately and not um, as one substituting or working with the other one. So that I think that it's only fair to look from them uh, from the principles perspective, uh, which um, they are built on. Um, the, the next question was how we outreach the students. Um, um, for us, uh, as a global organization of quality assurance providers, um, access to global student communities is a bit challenging. We have been in good touch contact with the European Student Union. It's just because in that region, this, the union is strong enough. In other regions, um, due to some factors, those organizations are not well formed and um, it's a bit difficult to identify the body which through which we could be able to outreach them and work with them but we are always open to work with the university associations with the student unions and take it further there and Simona wants to help me here as well. That's just just a very short uh, add on uh, which uh, Susanna said. Uh, it's just uh, very recent that uh, we have been uh, contacted by uh, the um, students from the Global Students Forum, uh, which are um, young in uh, developing their and strengthening their organization. And they are really interested to uh, open the discussions with uh, INCAHE and see how we can uh, um, cooperate uh, in order to, to uh, strengthen the, the student involvement. So uh, from this point of view, the, the direction is a very new one and uh, open, yeah. So I want to take one more from the from the uh, chat, and then we can move back over to the Q and A because there's additional questions there now. And the the one from the chat is, how can any academic or QA professional join in Inquahi as an external reviewer for any international quality audits? So it's a participation question. Yeah, for us, it's clear. I mean, um, uh, anytime, Nguahi is an inclusive organization and, and it's not in vain that we're using this uh, principle of inclusiveness. You would see it embedded in everything we do in the membership, in the, in the um, uh, uh, activities we're conducting. So uh, if you want to become a, a reviewer, we, you are welcome to send your CVs there. It will be reviewed by the um, committee that deals with the external reviews. And then you will undergo special preparations to, to be part of this um, quality assurance procedure. Okay, so let's move over to the Q&A again. Um, <clears throat> first question is, do these standards reflect quantitative assessment of quality standards of higher education institutions as done by various ranking agencies? I, I think that we already responded to this question that these are totally qualitatively different approaches, the quality assurance and the 
um, uh, ranking. So we're not mixing them or both. We look at them separately. And in our, um, our reviews, we look at both qualitative and quantitative parts of the outcomes. But basically, one of the major changes, as we have said, in these standards is outcome and output driven. So we will be evaluating more of the outcomes, qualitative and quantitative, in qualitative and quantitative um, aspects. And the next question is about um, review reports. Uh, are they, are they um, where can we see the reports or is it just the organization under review only? Well, of course, we haven't started to do these reviews uh, yet. And uh, the intention is to, to have a registry, um, but these are primarily for enhancement purposes. So I will let, uh, Susanna, do you want to elaborate on that at all? Um, I understand where Aurelia comes from, uh, and as we have said, this is global um, organization and the standards are global and they have to be acceptable in different parts of the globe. Whatever is fully acceptable in Europe in terms of 100% of publication of reports might not be acceptable in other parts of the globe where you can get into court once you publish something. Um, you know, um, 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 put on the website. So uh, there, there are uh, diverse cultures we are dealing with. And um, one of the challenges we had to go through when we set up a standards to make sure that all the seven regions globally are accommodated under these standards. And yes, we are going, the, the reports are going to be published as like our gu guidelines of good practice. The reports of, on GGP reviews, they are on published and they are on the website. But um, it's um, it depends on the, the extent of detail details that you are requiring to see that. But yes, reports are published. Okay, there's a question about I guess the transition from from the GGP reviews to the ISGs and when will we? How is that transition uh, going to be managed? If you want. Yeah. 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 No, as, uh, as we said before, um, at the moment we can, uh, through January to July, you can do either the GGP review or the ISG review, but from July onwards, it's only going to be, we have, we will have done the full transition to international standards and guidelines. And the GGPs are in fact the model, the baseline model of our ISGs. In the revised format. Yeah, it built from them. Yes, and then will it will will the external review be online or um, on site? Well, as we all know uh, now, after COVID, <laughs> we all are already used to both ways of procedures, depending on the situation. But predominantly, this will be uh, face to face. But again, depending on the situation, depending on the, uh, you know, um, countries, some countries might not have um, wide access of external people going there. As a global organization, as I have said, we're dealing not only with a, a small regional scope of things, we're dealing with um, 200 plus countries in the globe. So we have to consider the specifics of access, specifics of delivery, but predominantly this is um, face to face. But of course, online options are also there. Okay, so I just went back through the chat. I don't think there was any questions there that we missed and we've uh, answered all of the Q&A questions. <clears throat> and uh, if there are no further questions, maybe I can uh, wrap up and then um, um, if any of the panelists want to add anything. But I just wanna say um, thank you for attending the presentation. <clears throat> We're happy to, um, to give you this overview of you know, how the ISGs came to be and why they came to be and uh, the methodology behind their development and the scope of, of participation and contribution there, how they're structured, how the modules work and how the quality enhancement continuum is structured to add continuing value. 
So uh, we hope that this is informative for you. And certainly um, if you have, uh, if you think about this and you have questions um, after the session, we certainly are open to answering any of them. You can send them into the secretariat and we're help, happy to ad address this. And if you'd like to attend our, um, the, the next uh, presentation about this that happens in uh, towards the end of January, you can see that information on our website. And then these, the ISGs themselves are also on our website. And I believe they've been posted in the chat or the link to them has been posted in the chat. So uh, we'd really, really appreciate your participation today. And panelists, do you have anything you would like to add? I just want to add, thank again each and every one of you. Even this feedback coming here, it's already a contribution to our um, joint cause of quality assurance. Thank you very much, everybody. And we're always here ready for you. If you have any question, any, any elaboration, any clarification, we're always happy here to be with, be with you, support you, and guide you through these challenging times we're going through. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.